first reading today is from Genesis 12, 10 to 20, and can be found on your yellow handout at the front. So there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman, beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is my wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, and it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princess, princes, princess of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And, from, and for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of, Sarah, because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And the second reading on the back of your handout, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 58. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some kind, other kind of grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. If it is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are, who are of the dust. <laughs> and, as the man of, and as is the man of heaven, so also are those... Oh, hang on. <laughs> Let me start that again. <laughs> the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, 
Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the, in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Christ is risen. He is risen that is, I know it's not Easter, uh, but we can and we should celebrate Jesus rising from the dead, his resurrection at all times, because it means our victorious resurrection, our victorious resurrection to a body fit for a heavenly life. That's what we're hearing about today. Our victorious resurrection to a body fit for a heavenly life. Now, our victory or our victorious resurrection isn't because of something we did. We didn't defeat death, uh, but Jesus did. You see, it's our Bradbury win. Uh, you know, Stephen Bradbury, 2002 Winter Olympics, 1,000 metre speed skating, and uh, there's five of them in the actual finals here. And this is the moment when four out of the five fall down. And what does he do from 20 metres back? He just glides <coughs> into the victory. See his face. He can barely believe it. But he's celebrating it. And he's going to hold on to that goal and he's never letting it go. And so it should be with us. This is a victory that's ours because Jesus' victory is our victory when we put our trust in him. And we ought to celebrate. We ought to live as victors every single day. That's what this passage is about. It's what 1 Corinthians 15 is about. But particularly in this passage, we're getting two important questions are being asked that are really helpful for us. Now, Paul, it's important for us to know, uh, he's having a bit of an argy-bargy with the Corinthians. They're a pretty messy church. And one of the things they're talking about is the resurrection. And in particular, there's either people who don't believe in the resurrection after death or they're thinking, oh, we'll be raised, but we'll kind of be this spiritual being, disembodied, whatever. And so he's going, no, 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 no. And he's been setting it straight. And today, there's two questions that I'd be surprised if you haven't wondered about at some point. The first one is, what kind of body will we have? The second question is, how's it going to happen? After death, what, how is it? that I'm going to get this body, especially if you're dead. So let's have a look at these two great questions as we think about our victorious resurrection. Firstly, our heavenly body. Our heavenly body. Uh, in verse 35, Paul says, How are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have? So, Paul, he wants the Corinthians in this next section, and he wants us, in a sense, to look around at creation and all that God has made and just see God's different splendor, his different splendor. Take the seeds, he says. You know, you plant a seed, you put it in, it's kind of, it's like it dies, and then this incredible thing like wheat or another crop or a tree grows. You don't plant the wheat fully grown into the ground and then somehow it stands up. You don't plant the tree into the ground and it pops up. No, so it is with us. We're like that seed that's sown on this earth, but it has to be planted and died and then something will happen. But even just thinking about seeds, Paul says, of the millions of seeds, all the different things that come, this is the different splendor of our God. Take skin. He says, think of all the different animals, some with fur, some with fins, 
uh, some with feathers, and then there's us who are a little bit boring, really. Um, but there's so many different kinds of animals, isn't there? God did that. Take the stars. Just think for a moment about the power of the sun. Or the fact that all the stars are different and and have their own different splendor. God did that. It's all pointing to the different splendor of God. And so he's saying, so that God, that powerful creator God, he can give us a body fit for heaven. A body fit for heaven. And what? A body. Like, Paul's just going to kind of help us to understand just how incredible this is. And so, uh, talking about this idea of this body, this, he calls it spiritual, or we could say heavenly body. Verse 42, so will it, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. So will it be with us. This same incredible creator, different splendor God, He's not going to kind of go, oh, I don't know what to do now. No, he is going to absolutely do something amazing. And so he takes us back to the idea of the seed, the seed being sown. And, and what he's talking about here when he uses this refrain of sown is that's our body, our life now. But look at what God is going to do, he's saying. And he keeps kind of playing one off against the other. But it is this body, this life is sown in firstly dishonor. That's our sin against God. We're sown in weakness. And I'm sure we have all felt that at one time or another. It's sown natural. Or there's a sense here what he's talking about here is it's, it's finite, it's limited. That's what was sown. But what is going to come up is a body fit for heaven. Oh, it's going to be imperishable. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be spiritual. Or it's going to be from God without the limits or being finite. It's infinite, like God. That's the body he's talking about. And he's just saying, marvel at it. Be totally blown away by it. But know that Jesus' resurrection is essential for us to have that heavenly body. There's no other way. And so verses 45 to 49, again, he kind of keeps playing off these two ideas. The first Adam, it's talking Adam and Eve there, and the second Adam, that's Jesus. And he's saying... Let's look at the grandest display of God's different splendor in our heavenly body. And he goes on to talk about how that will be, this spiritual body. So Adam, Adam was given breath for life. He takes us back to Genesis 2, 7, where God breathed life in him. He didn't have it. But the second Adam, Jesus, he is a life-giving spirit. He's actually going to give us this life this heavenly body and it will be abundant life it's not just about the body adam adam was from dust and he's bound to dust but jesus jesus he's from heaven and so in verse 49 we read and just as we have borne the image of the earthly man so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man this is where it reaches its greatest height adam is of the image of the earthly man but through jesus we can actually share his image this is extraordinary because what he's talking about here is the fact that we will be restored to the image of god None of this, especially being in Jesus' image, can we have through Adam, through that earthly humanity. It just, there's no way, Paul's saying, that you can jump into that sphere. It doesn't just sort of trickle along. No, they're two separate ways. And so as we ask these questions about, well, what kind of body am I going to have? Will, will I fly? 
I'd really love to be able to fly, by the way. Um, will I be able to breathe underwater? Will I be able to walk on water? Will I be able to pop into rooms like Jesus did? Often we're thinking, what age will I be? Will I be young again? Hopefully no pimples. Um, will I have hair? <laughs> Lots of important questions, but actually, really, they fade, really, because in the end, the most important thing is that this body fit for heaven will be in the image of Jesus. Not just in, in physical but in its glory. So there's two important truths for us to, to take on board and, and shape our thinking from this, this heavenly body. Firstly, when our body gets, fa- when our body fails, you might already know some of that, when it gets frail, when it falls, what God is saying, don't wish you were younger. Don't look at younger people going, oh, I wish I had that body or I wish I had my body. No, don't, don't look back. But look ahead. And in that moment, thank God for the heavenly body that he's going to give you. That's the first truth that needs to shape our thinking. The second one is this. What Paul has been talking about here is that we will have a real body with Jesus. Not some spiritual existence, not some disembodied state. And so as other religions uh, and certainly new age ideas say, oh, you can transcend or you can be actualized and ascend to this particular state. No, he says, no, in Adam we are bound to dust and death. There is no way to get to that other side, if you like. It's only with Jesus that we will have his image and a heavenly body. That's the first truth, or the first question that's answered about our heavenly body. The second one is to do with our imperishable victory. An imperishable victory is what we have. Uh, The NRL is... uh, Spruiking the grand final with this particular promo. You'll see it in the picture down the bottom there. It says, real glory awaits. And it will last for four months before the next season starts and we're looking for the next premier. Like, it just doesn't last. Like so many things, this kind of glory or victory will fade. not our imperishable victory. So Paul goes on in verse 50 there to say that God is too holy and heaven is too great for us just to waltz on him, for us to enter by ourselves. But a change is coming. A change is coming when Jesus returns. And what a change. And so in verse 51 he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. This mystery he's talking about here is so how's it going to happen? How am I going to get this body? He says, we will not all sleep. Not everybody's going to die before Jesus comes back. But we will all be changed. It's very deliberate that he uses that word change there. He could have said, oh, you're going to get a brand new body. But he's saying change. There's a continuity about us that will be changed. We're not made into something new or something else. It will still be us. Just as the disciples were able to recognize Jesus, so too we won't just kind of disappear and become some alien or something. No, we'll be us. This is the incredible thing that God is going to do. And so in 52, he says, in a flash, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet sound, it's going to be instant. You're not going to go back to being a little baby and have to grow into this thing. No, it's just bang, it's going to happen. And it's happening when Jesus returns. That's the trumpet sound. That's the call. Jesus has returned. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will, dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So if we've died at this point, what Paul's saying is, God, 
as he can do. He's going to gather your atoms, whether they've been decaying in the ground or they're a pile of ashes. Doesn't matter. Nothing's impossible for him. He is going to change you and make you, he says, Im- imperishable. It's a great word. But another idea is this idea of indestructible. The words kind of mean the same. I, I just like indestructible. The thought of being, I'm indestructible. Doesn't that sound great? It's a body that's never going to break. It's never going to decay. It's never going to stop. Uh, The human heart has 2.5 billion beats on average before it stops. This one's just going to keep going forever. It's immortal, he says in verse 54. And that's slightly different. It's this idea that, no, it's never going to die again. So there's no more death. It shouldn't surprise us if we've been reading through 1 Corinthians 15 because in verse 26 we're told the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's as if Jesus with his resurrection has got his boot on the neck of death just waiting for that final blow when he returns. And it's gone. Our imperishable victory, you see, is a life without death. A life without death just just imagine that i mean every moment of our life now every moment is in some way touched by death isn't it whether it's things ending or breaking or being lost it's all about death but in heaven we will never experience that touch of death no matter how light it is, not even for a millisecond. That's our imperishable victory. Because, verse 54, death has been swallowed up in victory, in Jesus' victory. And so we can say, where, O death, is your victory? But our imperishable victory is also a life without sin life without sin where O oh, death is your sting verse 56 the sting of death is sin he's reminding us that the consequences of us turning our back on god is death in fact in romans 6 23 we're told that the wages of sin is death what we earn just like a wage for rejecting god and rebelling against him is death we just keep earning it but now Because Jesus has paid the cost. Where's the sting of death? He continues in the power of sin is the law. God's law. That we stand rightly condemned because of our failings against him. And our rebellion against him. But we're told no Christ has satisfied the demands of the law. Fully, completely, eternally on the cross. And so... Where, O oh death, is your sting? It is no more in Jesus. So we can have a life without sin. We were sown in dishonor, but we will be raised in glory. In Romans 3.23, uh, we're told that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've fallen away from it, but now we're going to be raised To share in it. No more hurting others. Or even ourselves. Won't that be so good? No more struggling and surrendering to sin, to our sinful desires. Oh, what what a weight that will lift. Our imperishable victory is a life without sin. And so thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. A great verse to memorize. Verse 57, thanks be to God. 
for this incredible victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just for a minute, imagine that you've got your passport, you've bought your plane ticket, crazy expensive as they are, but you've also planned your dream trip. You've got all the tours booked and places you're staying and things that you're going to see and marvel at and adventures you're going to have, the whole bit. And you get your passport and your tickets and your itineraries and you put it in a drawer and you forget about it. And you miss the flight. And you don't stay there, you don't go there, you don't do anything. Can you imagine that for a second? No, that would be ridiculous. But even more ridiculous for us to do that with our victorious resurrection. We are to live for the fact we will have a life without death and a life without sin, without weakness, without limit through our victorious sorry, our imperishable victory. And that means, that means it must shape our life now. Our life now today. In fact, if you go to verse 58, what's the very first word? Who can call it out for you? What's the first word? Therefore, Therefore that's right. In other words, in light of everything that I've been saying for the whole of this chapter and certainly today, therefore, this is your life now. God is saying, you cannot just walk out of here going, oh, that was nice. No, God is saying, this is how it changes your life today, tomorrow, as you head to eternity. This is how. Firstly, our victorious resurrection means we can stand firm in the face of death, in the face of aging, in the face of chronic illness and, and all those issues, because of the resurrection, not because we're suddenly so strong and faithful, no, because of the resurrection we can stand firm when we keep holding on to it and looking at it. In fact, we need to be preparing, that's what it's talking about here, preparing to face these circumstances, let alone death. So that we don't get surprised when we get there. So that we let nothing move you. It's so easy to be distracted by earthly things, especially our bodies, to get caught up on in the body we want to have or the body we used to have or what's going wrong with our body. But no, we need to be looking to the resurrection to stand firm. When you get that, significant life-impacting diagnosis, whatever it is. What will you be thinking? How will you respond? Will you be thinking, oh, it's robbing me? Or, or maybe it's somebody that you love. It's robbing them. Or will you be thinking, oh, God is getting me ready for my heavenly body. That might sound a little bit naive and ridiculous, but actually God is actually saying, I can, I can help you to do that. I can help you to think that way. If you focus, if you look and long and pray about this victorious resurrection and this heavenly body, you'll be able to think and pray and say, God is getting me ready for my heavenly body. But our victorious resurrection also means that we have the privilege and the responsibility to labour in the Lord. Continuing there in verse 58, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. So much of life is in vain in the sense of it just doesn't last. You keep having to do it again and again and again. Mowing, cleaning, cooking, working, whatever it is, it's just same things have to keep on. It, it's vain in the sense of it does not last, but not the labour in the Lord which means the things of eternity, only they will last. So practically, what does this look like? Well, it's a great thing to share a meal with someone. Uh, we're encouraging in the Bible to be hospitable. Wonderful. But they'll be hungry again tomorrow. It just doesn't last. But if we build a real relationship where we love them and we have the opportunity under God to share the good news of Jesus in some form. 
God can use that. God can use that for eternity. It may be that he uses that to help them to become alive with Christ. Our lives can have the greatest purpose and legacy ever. It can be about the labor in the Lord. That's eternal. That's what will last. So many things in heaven we will not even give a millisecond of thought to. And so we've got to be asking ourselves, am I giving myself fully to the work of my career? Or my retirement? Or my family? Or Is that what I'm giving myself fully to? Because it is in vain, God says. It's not going to last. There are things we need to do because we're part of this world, but let us give ourselves fully, heart, mind, body and soul to the work of the Lord. Uh, One morning after when I was coming out from a surf, I saw a woman uh, on the beach and she had a metal detector thing and she was walking up and down the beach and I got to chatting with her and it turns out that her and her husband had been travelling the whole east coast. They'd gone all the way up and down and now they were going back and every beach she got a chance to, she was out there beep, 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 doing the whole thing, right? And I'm thinking, this has got to be pretty awesome. I said to her, what is your greatest find, the big treasure that you've found? And she looked down and she thought about it for a while, anticipation's building and she says, I found a $2 coin one. If you and I work for the things of now, it will be worth less than a $2 coin if that's what we give ourselves to. But, but we, we can serve the Lord, labour in the Lord, and these things will last for eternity as we seek for ourselves and others to be made alive with Christ. That's what it is. Being alive with Christ is about labouring in the Lord. It's about coming to know Christ, myself and yourself more and more, and others too. It's about growing in Christ so that we together can be more like Jesus. It's about connecting with Christ, being a part of this community and loving and serving and and getting to know one another. It's about serving Christ. In Sure, in formal ministries on a Sunday, but as we go about our lives, who are we serving? Serving Christ. And finally, it's about sharing Christ so that others who are dead now, bound to the dust, can be made alive with Christ. This is how we celebrate. And this is how we live out our victorious resurrection to a body fit for a heavenly life. And it's going to be Awesome. So let's stand firm and labor in the Lord. Let's pray. Mighty and merciful God, we praise you for Jesus' resurrection from the dead, where death has been swallowed up in his victory and its sting has been removed. We thank you that we can share in his victory in our own resurrection through our faith in him. And so we pray this morning that you'd help us to look forward every day to our heavenly bodies so that we will stand firm trusting in our victory over death. And so we will labour for the Lord doing things that are eternal. Amen.